is just amazing how many people are interested in the impact of nutrition on mental health. I mean, how many academics have this opportunity of speaking to an audience like this? So thank you for coming. And um, this, it's, it really means a lot to me that my research is hopefully going to make a difference for you. Apparently, um, you need to leave your questions until the end. And I'll probably speak for about 50 minutes. And um, apparently, if, you, if there's an earthquake, then <laughs> just get under the desk, run out. Apparently, there's a spot on Clyde Road. <laughs> So just to introduce myself, I'm a professor of clinical psychology. I've been at the University of Canterbury for 14 years now. I came from Canada. I did my training at the University of Calgary under Bonnie Kaplan, who is just a phenomenal mentor and got me interested in the area of mental health and nutrition. I went to the university, I went to um, the Hospital for Sick Children for two years for a postdoc under Rosemary Tannock. Again, a phenomenal experience of someone who has such a wealth of knowledge in the area of ADHD and learning disabilities. And then I've been lecturing here in the clinical program ever since. I, very, very early on in my career, I came to a conclusion, and I sometimes think this is really sad to come to this conclusion so early on in a career, was that the work that we were doing for people with mental health wasn't good enough. That the people that we were seeing clinically, the people who were receiving conventional treatments, were not always getting better to the most optimal place that we would like to see them get to. And so despite receiving conventional treatments, what I was learning was that they were still impaired, that there were many people who continue to suffer. And I wondered, is there another way forward? Is there something else that we can do? And that led to the research that I'm going to talk about with you today. And how many people here are, know of people who suffer from mental illness? And how many people here feel that the treatments that the, their relatives, their friends are receiving is making them well? <laughs> How many people think that we can do better? OK, so I'm going to share with you some discoveries that I've been making. So one of the reasons why we are probably, many of you are here today. Volume up. Is that better? More? Are you sure? How's that? Better. Okay, I was told to just put it at a, it's going to start echoing. That's not, it's too high, isn't it? Okay, is that right? Okay, thank you. No other questions, though. Okay, one of the reasons why we're here today is that there's an increasing prevalence of mental problems. If we look at the epidemic in New Zealand, one-sixth of New Zealanders are suffering from a mental illness in any one year. So that's over half a million New Zealanders. 33,000 33, of our children are diagnosed with an emotional and behavioral problem, including depression, anxiety, and ADHD. That's a two-fold increase since the survey was done in 2006, 2007. Younger people, those who are economically disadvantaged, Maori and Pacific Island people, are more likely to suffer from psychological problems. Mental disorders account for 23% of health-related disability worldwide, with depression accounting for the second highest number of years lost to disability. And when we look at the research, and this is just a, a study that's looking at um, boys and girls from 1986 to 2006, we see an increase in the rates of depression being diagnosed in those children. The second reason that we're here is that there is a danger of mental health care bankrupting our society. This is the projected forecast of the cost of mental illness. If it continues to go on the way it is, that it's going to be increasing from 50 billion in 2011 upwards of 300 billion. We have to do something about this. 
This data about the number of Americans on long-term disability for mental illness, and we're looking at the millions of adults who are affected and on, mental, on a long-term disability from 1987 to 2007. It's been increasing. Now, what is special about 1987? I sh so no, sorry, I shouldn't be asking. <laughs> In 1987, Prozac came out. Prozac was supposed to make us all happy. Why have we got such an increase in the number of adults who are on a disability? The third reason why many of us might be here is that our current gold standards are turning out to be less effective than hoped. The way we've understood drugs for the last several decades is that they have great benefit with very few side effects and very little withdrawal. That's what we've been led to believe. There was a study that came out this year that was done by John Reed and colleagues from the University of Auckland looking at uh, surveying 1,829 New, Zealander, New Zealanders who were taking antidepressants and they were asked about the side effects that they were experiencing. Now remember, side effects are generally seen as being fairly minimal, but here's what they found. 62% reported sexual difficulties, 60% feeling emotionally numb, 42% feeling a reduction in positive feelings, 39% caring less about others, 39% feeling suicidal. Now you might say, well of course they're feeling suicidal because they're depressed, but they're taking antidepressants. So if the antidepressants were so good, they shouldn't be feeling so suicidal. 55% of them experienced withdrawal, 27% reporting being addicted to the drugs. <coughs> There's another thing that you need to be aware, and this is coming out more and more in the media and in, in, um, in books, uh, uh, popular books like Ben Goldacre's book called Bad Pharma. What he's documented is that there's a publication bias occurring. And so if we just look at antidepressant medications in terms of what's being published, and this is what we use in order to determine clinical effectiveness and whether or not a treatment should be used, 37% of the trials are positive that are published. Three are negative. When they look at the unpublished literature, what they find is that there's only one unpublished positive trial, but 33 unpublished. That means that 97% of the trials that are positive are published, and only 8% of the negative trials are published. So if you're a GP and you're wondering whether or not a treatment is effective for depression, you look to the literature, but you're not going to be aware of the unpublished data. Half of the trials go missing. So then when we look at this risk and benefit ratio, maybe it's more like this. That the benefit of the drugs is not as good as we hoped, and the side effects and the withdrawal may be much larger than we expected. Let's look at long-term outcomes for a few medications, and I'm going to choose stimulants as the, fir um, the first one to give you some, some data on. Stimulants, that's Ritalin. Those are the drugs that are used for our children who have ADHD. There was a massive study that was done that started in the late 1990s called the MTA trial. And what they did was they looked at whether or not medications were better than the stimulants were better than placebo, uh, uh, better than community uh, treatment, better than, uh, better than medication plus cognitive behavior therapy. What they found was that medications in the short term were the best treatment. And that was regardless of whether or not it was combined with the behavior therapies. And so the conclusion of that particular study, and it was a large trial, was that medications really are they should be the primary way forward in treating people who have ADHD. The three-year data, though, is concerning. Those who are medicated show an increased core symptoms, higher delinquency scores, and greater overall functional impairment than those children 
who were unmedicated. We need to pay attention to this data because in the long term, it looks like we might be having a negative effect on children with ADHD when we use the stimulants, despite the fact that in the short term, the effects are very positive. And we need to make that risk-benefit analysis to determine whether or not it's worth medicating children for an acute effect versus the potential long-term risk. This study just came out in 2014, and it's alarming. This is looking at the long-term use of antipsychotics for the treatment of schizophrenia. The one in, this one here in, in, um, in black is looking at the rate of psychotic activity in people with schizophrenia who stay on medication. The, the data down here are showing the psychotic activity of those who remain unmedicated all the way through that 20 year span. I don't know about you, but when I look at this data, I'm concerned. There are, of course, it's a naturalistic um, follow-up, so there are questions around whether or not these people here are perhaps more severe than these people here. But at the end of the day, we're not eliminating the psychotic activity with antipsychotic medication. They're continuing to suffer. And that the people who were unmedicated don't have an increase in psychotic activity over time. They actually do much better. And so these findings clearly go against the recommendation that schizophrenic patients have to continue taking their medication long term in order to prevent relapse. The optimal care using today's medications, too many people will not recover. And in New Zealand, this study again just came out 2014 by Roger Mulder and Chris Frampton. And what they did was they looked at the outcomes of people with mood disorders before the advent of psychopharmacology. And what they actually came to the conclusion was that back in the time when psychopharmacology wasn't being used, people actually did quite well. And what they concluded from their data and looking at it and comparing it to how well the outcomes are for people who are depressed now that we do use psychopharmacology regular, was that the rate of recovery and remaining well appears high compared to modern cohorts. This review provides no support to the belief that pharmacological treatments have resulted in an improvement in the long-term outcome of patients with mood disorders. These studies are all have been coming out over the last five years. This is new, but I think we need to pay attention. So what are we to do? I wonder, with all of this data that's suggesting the long-term outcomes of using medications are less than optimal, maybe it's time to revisit a very old idea. And that is looking at the effect of nutrition on our mental health. And we've known this for centuries. Let food be thy medicine, and let thy me medicine be thy food. Mrs. Beaton's book of household management actually came out in 1861. My copy was 1895. Um, what did she say? She said, diet can cure where drugs are useless or worse. Diet is always harmless where drugs are usually dangerous. The People's Home Library, this was used by pioneers. And what it said about the cause of insanity was imperfect nutrition. So we knew about the importance of diet for mental health in biblical times, in Greek times, in pioneer homesteading times, but what do we know about it in the 21st century? Early poor nutrition is proving a risk factor for ongoing psychological problems. Children who were malnourished in the first six years of their life have been found 30 to 40 years later to have an increased risk for psychological problems. 
Women malnourished in pregnancy during times of famine have been known to have offspring with an increased risk for psychological problems. Women who eat the Western diet during pregnancy and or show a low adherence to the Mediterranean diet or a prudent diet show increased risk that their offspring are going to develop psychological symptoms. So early nutrition is essential building blocks for good health. There have been a lot of association studies. That's where you look at people with mental illness, you look at their, their rates of mental illness within a population, and you compare that with what they're eating. And what they look at here is they're looking at dietary patterns. And so they're deciding whether or not someone falls in, say, a, a healthy dietary pattern or, they, or a Mediterranean type of, a prudent type of pattern or healthy, healthier pattern of, of um, diet intake. And in these studies, they use huge cohorts. They use lots of, they have thousands and thousands of people where they, they assess their diet and they determine what kind of dietary pattern they fall into. And in these association studies, what they find over and over again is that people who are eating, say, a low intake of healthy foods have a much higher rate of problems, mental health problems, than those who have a higher intake. And those who are having the higher intake of unhealthy foods equally have a higher rate of mental health problems. And so this is showing that what you're eating currently is a related to your mental health. But the issue associated with these studies is that it could be that what you're, how you're feeling influences what you eat. And so that's called the reverse causation bias. And you can't determine which direction it's going in with these types of um, cross-sectional studies. So we need to look at longitudinal studies. That is, they look, looking at your dietary pattern at time X and then follow you to time Y and see what your mental health is at time Y to see whether what you were eating at time X can predict how you're feeling at time Y. So in this study, they looked at three and a half thousand people in the UK and, what they, and they followed them for five years and then they looked at depression at the end of that and what they found was that people who were more likely to be eating a Western dietary pattern were more likely increased odds of developing depression and that eating whole foods was protective. So this is contrary to the reverse causality hypothesis. It's suggesting that what you're eating can have a difference in terms of your mental health down the road. Another study. This is huge. This is over 80,000 people who were surveyed in Japan and followed for four years. And what they found was that a prudent dietary pattern characterized by a high intake of vegetables, fruits, mushrooms, seaweed, and fresh fish was associated with a decreased risk of suicide. Another study. This is the Sun study. This is, has over 9,000 people within this study. And what they did was that they took 9,000 people who were not depressed and not taking antidepressants and followed them over a six-year period to determine whether or not any of them became depressed. And they found that 493 of those people became depressed. And what they were able to show was it was related to what you were eating. So the more likely that you were eating fast food, the higher the chances that you would develop depression. Processed pastries, muffins, donuts. Again, the same pattern. The more you're eating those types of foods, the greater your risk of depression within 6.2 years. So these studies from Australia, Spain, and the UK in a nutshell suggest that people who eat traditional, unprocessed, Mediterranean, prudent types of diets have lower rates of mood and anxiety disorders, whereas the people who eat Western processed diets have higher rates of mood and anxiety symptoms. The Mediterranean diet, just for those who don't know what that is, that's, that's um, 
lots of vegetables, fruits, nuts, high legumes, um, a lot of whole grains, fish, small amount of meat, um, low fat dairy, and low to moderate alcohol. <laughs> so what's good about the Mediterranean prudent diets is that they have a lot of vitamins and minerals. And what's wrong with Western processed diets is that they have fewer vitamins and minerals. And so what is the obvious solution? Let's tell everyone to eat better. That's easy, isn't it? So it's easier to change a man's religion than to change his diet. And I asked one of my children if, if he was allowed to eat whatever he wanted and that his parents didn't control what he ate, what would he eat for the day? And there was fortunately one apple in there, so I felt that we've had some influence on him. But otherwise it was McDonald's, fries, um, pasta, I'm embarrassed to say, say this, uh, uh, pancakes, bacon, <laughs> and I'm trying to think what else there was. That's not bad. That was his diet for the day. Anyway, so I think left to their own devices, children would likely make some fairly interesting dietary choices. So we do have to have an influence them. And in terms of what, what's happening in schools, that it's important that what's, op what's available to children in schools is, is a nutritious one, nutritious diet. So, but then, even if we could change people's diets, my question is, would a ch change in diet work for everyone? And I'm not sure, but I think it's unlikely, particularly for people who are vulnerable to mental illness. And I'll just try to walk through and tell you why I think that. The first thing is that our soil is not generally remineralized. We add nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but oftentimes we don't give any of the other, put any of the other minerals back into the soil. Nutrient content of our food has decreased, and I'll show you some data on this one, and that rapidly growing crops may be nutrient poor. The use of glyphosate, grit roundup. Glyphosate exposure has been found to result in poor capture of minerals from the soil and nutrient poor crops. So the use of the herbicides and pesticides can be influencing the food and the nutrient content of your, the food that you eat. Some other more personal or, in, or individual things that can go on. The health of our gut is, very, is essential for the absorption of food. You're not what you eat, you're what you can absorb. And so if your gut is unhealthy due to the use of antibiotics or food insensitivities or potentially that you're, you're gluten intolerant, etc., etc., that's going to all influence the nutrients that your body will get out of the food, even if it's nutritious. And the, an, another thing to think about is what is called biochemical individuality. And that is that our nutritional needs across the human race can vary, and that each one of us has a, nutrition, a different nutritional need than someone else. So some people can get by with nutrient-deficient foods, whereas others may be more vulnerable to the nutrient depletion in the food and then show the expression of illness. Another thing that could be going on is that we all, that some people inherit what's called an inborn error of metabolism, and that that influences how well you can use the nutrients that you get out of your food. This means that the me metabolic reactions that are occurring inside of us are, are less than optimal in someone who has this type of um, genetic deficiency. What we know, though, in the area of physical illness is that if you flood the system with the, new, the say, the vitamin that is, uh, that is, is defi um, that where you have a, a, a mutation that prevents you from metabolizing, say, a vitamin, and you give a high dose of it, you can correct it so that optimal functioning can be um, reinstated. So if we look at, I just wanted to show you about the decrease in mineral contact. This, di the, um, this data comes from the UK. And what they did was they looked at the, the 1947 versus 1997 in terms of the mineral content of vegetables. And what 
um, mayor and colleagues were able to show was that there's been an overall depletion in the mineral content of our food over that 50-year period. So an apple of 1947 was far more nutritious than an apple of 1997. So this now comes round to the idea of should we then consider supplementing with micronutrients, that is minerals and vitamins, and if so, should we use single or should we use multiple? And I'm one to believe, based on reading the literature and trying to understand what's going on physiologically, to think that giving a single nutrient makes not, no physiological sense. What I've shown here is just the chemical pathways that are required in order to make serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter that's involved in, in mood. If we look at all these pathways, what we find is that we need different minerals and vitamins, a, a, a group of them, in order for those chemical reactions to occur. So copper, vitamin B6, iron, etc. So that giving one nutrient makes no sense if you're trying to correct and, it, and provide the body with all the nutrients that are required for optimal functioning. Here's another example. This is the Krebs cycle. This is a, a complicated one. I don't expect you to, to understand what's happening here, but the reason I put this up was to appreciate that for the, the formation of ATP, which is required for making energy, providing us with energy through the mitochondria, that we need, again, a whole host of different minerals and vitamins for this, the, the reactions to occur. So thiamine, iron, magnesium, riboflavin, etc. So all of those nutrients are required for the, the mitochondria to function effectively. So the conclusion of, if you think about it like this, then what we should come to is to think, if we're searching for the magic bullet, the magic nutrient, we're probably not going to get very far. There's been an enormous amount of research that's been looking for one nutrient. We look at the area of ADHD. There's been all these studies that have been done on zinc or iron. People are really excited these days about vitamin D and depression. We, we, we have this way of thinking that we can only manipulate one ingredient at a time in order to see whether or not it's got an effect. But really, if we look at it physiologically, it doesn't make sense to just do studies that are driven to look for the one single magic bullet. And so the approach that I've been taking my research is to look at a broad spectrum approach of using a broad number of micronutrients in order to see whether or not that, that can have a difference on psychological health. Just to really um, bring this one home, what I want you to just have a look at is this is an example of all the, of deficiencies that are occurring in the um, American population. This, that's where this data came from. That there can be deficiencies across a number of different nutrients. Now if we overlay this onto a dam and just imagine that those are holes in the dam and if there's a obviously the water is going to come out of the one where there's the greatest hole but if we plug that hole then all that's going to happen is that the water is going to emerge from somewhere else and so really addressing our physiological need, one nutrient at a time, doesn't make sense. The only way you're going to be able to plug it up is by providing all of the nutrients in combination. So what's the evidence? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through a progression of evidence, case studies, series, case series, case series of hundreds, case control, randomized control trials, and then roll out into clinical practice. And why is this level of evidence so important? And that's because that's evidence-based medicine. We need these types of studies in order for us to make a difference in terms of clinical practice. So case studies, here's one example. We have many of these cases in our lab, and I've just chosen one to illustrate the point. 
Brian's a 20-year-old male. He's got a, host of, a whole host of psychiatric illness when he comes to the lab. He's got ADHD. He's got depression. He's got anxiety, and he's abusing cannabis and nicotine. He's been tried on a whole host of different medications, many of them not having any effect on his symptoms whatsoever. He goes into an on, off, on, off um, type of design, that is where he goes on the nutrients, comes off of them in a controlled way, goes back on. His last one was more of a natural off because of the Brisbane floods and then the earthquake, so he ended up on a much longer off period. And so this is just showing the change in his symptoms over that period of time. These are T-scores, and 50 right here, I've just shown the clinical cutoff. So he's up here, he's very impaired in his ADHD symptoms, inattention, hyperactivity, impulsivity. And after eight weeks, he drops down into the normal range. He goes off, he returns back up there, he goes on, and he returns back into the non-clinical range. How big is this effect? It's a change of four standard deviations was equivalent to somebody growing from four foot ten to five foot ten. That's a huge effect. We're not observing small effects here. So that's a change in 30 centimeters. People should pay attention to changes like that. Case series. This is just looking at 11 adults in their depression mania and psychosis, and their means are dropping substantially within, within into a, a normal, um, non-clinical range across the board in all of those symptoms that were measured. A case series of hundreds. This is a, a database analysis where we looked at 120 children who were diagnosed with bipolar disorder who were put on micronutrients. And despite the fact that many of them were on medications which can, which can often complicate the response to the micronutrients, we still saw that 50% of them had a f greater than 50% reduction in their psychiatric symptoms, which is used as a, as a marker of clinical response. Case control. This is where you compare one group with another group that's been matched. And the example that I'm going to give you here is in autism. This is a study that was done by a psychiatrist in Mel, um, called uh, Louis Mel Madrona in Saskatchewan. And he, was, he has a private practice. And he had 44 people um, who had been diagnosed with autism who had chosen to use vitamins and minerals for the treatment of, of their, their symptoms. And so he, he collected data from another 44 people in his clinic who had chosen to use medications. So what this is showing is that not only was the micronutrient group better than, than medication group, not, not only did we see change in the micronutrient group, but it was better than the medication group. And the other thing that they observed was that the self-injurious behavior that can happen for a lot of children and adults with autism was substantially and significantly decreased in the group of p children and adults who were taking the micronutrients with no change in the group taking the medications. Randomized controlled trials. I reviewed this liter literature a year ago and actually was, was surprised at how many randomized controlled trials that have been done on using micronutrients for the treatment of depression, anxiety, ADHD, post-traumatic stress disorder, stress, autism, and offenders. There's a, over 20 positive randomized controlled trials that are showing benefit of micronutrients compared to placebo in the treatment of these psychiatric conditions. There were six negative trials when we did this review. The interesting thing about those six negative trials was that it was done on populations where they didn't have a psychiatric illness. So they had collected people from the, the general population and then look to see whether or not micronutrients would have an effect on their mood. So you're going to be, it's less likely that you're going to find an effect because they're not depressed to begin with. So I'm going to give you just a sample of these studies just so that you can get a flavor of what the randomized control trials are finding. This one is looking at supplementation in the prison population, 231 young adult prisoners. 
And what they looked at was the rate of disciplinary incidents within the prison and found a much greater 35% decrease in, that, in the um, number of disciplinary incidents occurring in those taking the micronutrients versus only 7% in those taking the placebo. This data here was collected here in Christchurch in my lab after the earthquakes. We randomized 91 people within our community about two months after the earthquake who were suffering from stress, depression, anxiety. And we gave them different, we gave them some of them high doses of, of B vitamins, low dose of vitamins and minerals, and then a higher dose of vitamins and minerals. And what surprised us was how effective the micronutrient formulas were in reducing the rates of PTSD symptoms within our population over a four week period. Some really substantial changes. But one in eight women in Christchurch are now taking antidepressants for stress. Nobody, everyone ignores this data. This is the control group over here. No difference, no change. So one of the thoughts that I've got on, whether, on why we see such benefits in reduction of stress after the earthquake using vitamins and minerals is that you need to think about the body like a tr that there's a triage and that we, the, the more severe patients always get treated first. So in the body, we, the fight-flight response is going to take all your nutrients and that will always get priority over things that may have a consequence in the long term for survival but have no immediate repercussions in the short term. And so by giving and supplementing the body with the nutrients during a time of high stress, we're providing the body with the additional nutrients that it probably needs. And what is it, was it protective in the long term? So we followed those people who, in that study, a year later to see how they were doing. And what we found was that those we had treated continued to do well and reduced right down into a very low range in stress. The control group did decrease, but they're still significantly higher than the group who we had treated acutely. The other thing we were able to do with this data in the long term was to look at whether or not people who had, been, who had stayed on the nutrients and how did they do, and also how did you do if you were switched to medications, which happened to a lot of people who went through our study at the end of the study. People who stayed on the nutrients were significantly better off than those here who switched to medications. This is a study looking at the effects of micronutrients on autistic behaviors. And what this study found was that there was benefit in the in much greater change in receptive language, hyperactivity, and tantruming in those children and adults who had been put on micronutrients compared to placebo. I wonder if it would have been an even greater effect, though, if they had looked at the health of the gut, because we know that in people with autism that the absorption of nutrients through the gut is, can be compromised. This is a study that we published this year looking at the effects of nutrients on ADHD behaviors. Again, significant effects, much greater changes in hyperactivity and inattention and those adults who were given the micronutrients compared to placebo with medium to large effect sizes. We were able to look at depression in our study because we had a certain number of people who entered our, AD our trial with ADHD also depressed and so we looked at that subgroup. Again, much greater change in depression scores in those people who were taking the micronutrients compared to placebo. We followed them up over long term. This is one year later. And what we're finding is that those people here who stay on the micronutrients stay well. And those people who come off of the micronutrients revert. And those people here who actually are ones who haven't done as well on the micronutrients have, have some change but not as great switch to medications and it doesn't make a huge difference. I'm going to show you a video of two young people, um, two mothers talking about their children in a pilot study that was run by a graduate student of mine, Heather Gordon, who's sitting in here in the audience. 
over here. So she collected this wonderful data. One of the things that we notice is that it, the change is never, it's not, a, it's not typically a quick change, that it's a very, very gradual change over several weeks where we see very slow changes over time. And then suddenly you realize that these children have changed. Um, but the other thing to notice is that when it works, and it doesn't work for everyone, I don't want to say that we're curing every single person who comes into our clinic. We're probably benefiting between 60 to 80 percent of people we see. But when it works, we observe that there's change across the board. It's not just in the thing that we're studying, that is ADHD. We're seeing the change, you know, they, she talked about the change in the bedwetting or the anxiety or just getting on better with other children. So we have all these unexpected effects that are happening as well. So does any of this that I've gone over amount to any type of evidence whatsoever? And I guess I'd say it depends on how we conceptualize mental illness. We have a couple of randomized control trials in different areas like ADHD or anxiety or um, stress or um, a, you know, one in, a couple of in autism, et cetera. Does that amount to evidence? And I think that if we see them as being discrete categories, then we'd say that there isn't much evidence. But if we see them as being perhaps that the, there's an underlying problem that's expressing itself differently in different people, well then maybe we have a little bit of evidence here. Bradford Hill, who was the one who created the basis of the modern randomized control trial, actually saw some, some, uh, um, some disadvantages to that in terms of it doesn't capture the, the breadth of what we should be looking at in terms of causation. And so he identified some other things that we need to look in terms of establishing causation. I feel that I've shown biological rationale. I've shown the strength of the association, the clinical significance that we're changing people's lives, the consistency of evidence across different places, across different countries. A preceding B, that is that we give the treatment and then the change occurs. And then I've shown you a lot of randomized control trials and other evidence showing some benefit. Well, but then I hear that vitamins are killing us. How many of you heard that in the media? Just a few of you. <laughs> That's it? A few of you? I hear about it. Maybe it's because I'm kind of tuned in. But there was a study that came out in 2007, and this was the title, Mortality and Randomized Trials of Antioxidant Supplements for Primary and Secondary Prevention, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis. And what they found was that there was a small increase in, uh, in those people who were taking the antioxidants. There was a slightly higher number of deaths in that group compared to those who were receiving no intervention or placebo. If you look at the data a little bit more closely, what we find is that there were 17,880 deaths, which is 13.1% of those taking the, anti the antioxidants, versus 10,000 in the other group, which is 10.5%. So that's a difference of 2.6%, which is a fairly small number. And if anyone understands an odds ratio, it's 1.04. It reaches significance because it's such a large sample, but it's a very, very small effect. The other thing is that they looked at all-cause all cause mortality. All-cause mortality is that you didn't die necessarily. We don't know whether or not you died because of taking the vitamins. People will have died because of um, dying in a plane crash or accidents or all of that. So they're, looking, they're not establishing why you died. The other thing is that they eliminated any trial where no one died in the trial. <laughs> so... What was the press on this? If you put, a, put this into a search engine, it's endless. Popular but dangerous, three vitamins that hurt you. Don't take your vitamins, your vitamin may be killing you. The case against multivitamins grows stronger. Are your morning vitamins slowly killing you? Vitamin overdose, how supplement pills can kill you. Now your vitamins are killing you. And then the AMA said, the big vitamin scare, American Medical Association claims vitamins may kill you. So that was the, the conclusion, and that was the media attention that was, was, was drawn on, the, on that study. What we didn't really hear about is that there were some other studies that looked at the same thing and didn't find any relationships in terms of mortality and the use of vitamins and minerals, but these studies didn't get much, of much press. So here's one that found no association. This one again, found no, uh, no association whatsoever. In fact, there were some protective effects of using 
some of the multivitamins. And then this one looked at whether or not you, these people in that meta-analysis where there was the 2.6% increase um, risk of death from all-cause mortality, that there were a third of them in those studies that actually reported a positive benefit of taking the antioxidants. So ultimately, though, you do need to do a risk-benefit analysis about whether or not you should take vitamins, even if that risk is true, the 2.6%. It's a small risk, and you need to consider that within the context of the benefit that you may experience from taking the, the um, vitamins and minerals, and whether or not you're taking them to treat something. We also need to think about it in terms of relative risk. Relative risk to a whole bunch of other things that do kill us. So this is looking at risk in Australia um, of death based on a, a whole bunch of different things. And this, this largest one here is preventable medical injury in hospitals. This is preventable pharmaceutical adverse reactions in hospitals. Traffic accidents gets a sm much smaller one. Soldiers serving in Afghanistan. Horse riding, drowning, workplace accidents. And this is the complementary medicines, dot too small to print. Just to give you a little bit of an idea about micronutrient safety, we're really focused on, re on recommended daily allowances. That's the RDA. But actually, there's a huge room of, of opportunity here before you get to what's called the toxic level or the upper limit of the micronutrient safety. And so we do, lots of people get really concerned about giving vitamins and minerals in a level that's higher than RDA, and that's what we do. But you need to be aware that there's a large space here where we can give the nutrients safely, and that's probably where we're going to get the benefit, is by giving them in a much higher dose than just RDA. From our studies using micronutrients, we find very few side effects. In fact, no group differences between those taking micronutrients and those taking um, placebo. The types of, of side effects that are reported to us are things like gastrointestinal and headaches often in the first few weeks that tend to resolve after making, uh, once they make, we make sure that they're taking it with food and plenty of water. It's remarkable are uh, the compliance rates in our group. We, the micronutrients that we're using, we give them at a dose of 12 to 15 pills a day. And we are finding that we're very successful at getting people to get into a, a, of a routine of taking the nutrients. We've looked at blood results. The only thing that's, that's come up in the blood results is a slight increase in those people taking micronutrients compared to placebo in terms of prolactin levels, but they still stay within the normal range um, that's given on the blood tests. We need, though, to study the long-term effects. That's, that's very, very important for this field of work. So the, finally, the rollout into clinical practice. I think we have some political challenges here. For this to roll out effectively into clinical practice, I think the pharmaceutical industry has to come clean. As long as we think that the treatments that we're receiving right now in terms of the form of drugs for the treatment of mental illness are good and efficacious, then it's going to be really hard for any other treatment to have any impact. And if we start to look at the evidence, it's not as good as we thought it was. And it should influence clinical practice. And I don't know how many people understand out there that we fund, our tax dollars fund, off-label use of drugs. That's when you get a drug where it was, you, it, was, it was given approval for the treatment of psychosis, but it's given for the treatment of sleep. You don't need to have evidence for that. There is no universal prevention approach to address poor diet. This needs to change. Do we need government legislation with respect to diet and food in order for there to be a much greater change. So akin to the changes in terms of smoking legislation so that people can, we can get a reduction in the number of people who are smoking. Or does it need to come from the grassroots? We all have a choice in what we eat. And if everyone stopped eating from the middle of the supermarket, which is where that's high likelihood of finding processed and packaged foods, and only shopped around the outside where you have your fresh foods, then we can make a change. We can, we can all make a difference. 
to what's available to us. Nutrients are not currently covered by our healthcare system. So even when we find that we can help people and that they benefit from it, they often go back to medications because they can't afford to stay on the nutrients because the medications are free and the nutrients aren't. Let me tell you about a case. This is looking at cost effectiveness. This is Andrew. Andrew, at age 10, had disturbances in sleep. He had hallucinations, delusions, problems with concentration. He was paranoid. He felt that his food was poisoned, that he was a murderer and adulterer. And he was admitted to the Alberta Children's Hospital inpatient mental health for six months. He had every test imaginable, and he was put on a whole host of different medications to try to change his symptoms. After six months, various medication trials, he was discharged, completely unchanged. The parents heard, out about, heard about the micronutrients, and they approached the psychiatrist and said, we'd like to try the micronutrients to help our son. And so they, so they talked to Megan Rodway, who was the psychiatrist who was treating him, and she said, this is snake oil, but I don't have anything better to offer. Within six months of being on the micronutrients, Andrew's psychiatric symptoms were all gone and maintained four years later. No clinically significant anxiety, no psychotic symptoms. He's enjoying school, he has friends, and he has normal relationships. This is looking at his hallucinations and delusions and how they decreased on the micronutrients over that six-month period. Let's look at the cost. I read it in the newspaper this morning that it's $500 a night to keep a mental health patient in our hospitals, wasn't it? Okay, so it cost the Alberta health care system $158,000 to have Andrew sit in a hospital for six months and not get better. The same amount of time, six months on the night micronutrients. It seems to me that, and this isn't covered. We won't, we won't try this first. But I think we owe it to these children to try something first that we know doesn't carry as great harm as we know the medications carry. We owe it to them to be exploring other avenues. The problem with the micronutrient that are available in our supermarket is that none of them have ever been studied for the treatment of psychiatric illness. And they're not developed that way and they probably nobody will because the market available is quite small relative to the market available for the general population. So there are actually very few micronutrient formulas that have been studied. <coughs> Along with Ian Shaw, who's a chemist here, at UC and a graduate student, Amy Harris, we looked at the doses of nutrients within the supermarket uh, uh, products and we compared them to the formulas that had been studied in research and what we found was that the dose of the over-the-counter supplements was nothing compared to the dose that was required in order to have a difference in the, in the um, psychiatric symptoms. That was Sorry, that one was um, B1, here's another example, B6, B12. So the dose is important. And so if you think that you can walk away from here and go and buy a one a day and have the effects that we've, I've been showing you here, let me know. <laughs> Please let me know. But I suspect that it won't have the same difference. I just show the slide because people always ask me, well, what, are the, well, what, what is useful? And so what I've done is put together the ones that have some evidence as, at some level to help with me a mental illness. And I'm happy to provide this to anyone who emails me or, or, um, and a or asks me about it. And uh, the ones that we've been studying are what one called Empire Plus. I've, I've studied Baraka, um, Daily Essential Nutrients, um, Daily Self-Defense, the ones that we've been using in our lab. So in closing, the messages that I'm not giving 
are the only cause of mental disorders is imperfect nutrition. Of course there are other things. There are other risk factors. There's genetics. There's environmental toxins. There's trauma. There are other reasons why people get mentally ill. So I'm just talking about one risk factor. Everything can be cured with nutrients. I said that there are some people who don't benefit. So we're not making it, we're not curing everyone, but we certainly are having an impact on a substantial number of people that we see. And all psychiatric medications is bad. That's not a message I want to give. But what I do want to say is that it, they're less, they're, they're, they're not as effective as we thought they were. But there are certainly, of course, people who have benefited from medications. So in conclusion, physiologically, it makes sense. I hope I've convinced you of that, to provide the body and the brain with the nutrients to optimize functioning for those with psychiatric symptoms. If this cannot be achieved through diet manipulation alone, then maybe you need additional nutrients. And after a decade of research, most studies on broad-spectrum nutrients are positive across different countries, different formulas, and different mental health conditions. And so what if nutrition could treat mental illness? Maybe we go from this, where our standard is that we give medications first, you might get some psychotherapy and other things, to this, where we focus on lifestyle, diet, and supplements, and that if that's not effective, then we look at doing some stress reduction, psychotherapy, and only after that do we go to meds if none of these other things have been effective. It's our choice. We all, every time you make that decision of what you put in your mouth, you have a choice. You have a choice of what you eat. And so finally, I want to acknowledge the funding sources. It's very difficult to get funding for this work. But I've had some wonderful support from the Vic Davis Trust, the University of Canterbury, and a private donation from Mary Lockie who's a woman who really knows that nutrition is important to mental health and has had the courage to support my research. But I also want to acknowledge all the wonderful people who are in my lab, and many of them are sitting just over there all together. My graduate students, I can't do this work without my students, the collaborators, the psychiatrists, the medical practitioners, and the clinical psychologists in the community who have all made this work happen. So thank you.